Music, wow. please. Wow. This music. Oh, oh. It's, Woo! It's this I'm feeling it today, guys. Right. I am Good. feeling it. It's the Wild Times episode. Who cares? Probably a hundred at this point. I'm gonna start saying numbers. A day. Is yeah, it ninety it's numbers? It's like one yeah. fifty. It's good to remind us, w- remind us of how many weeks we've been at this shit. I love it. I love it. I, <laughs> I wouldn't love trade it, it for a lot of things, except money and fame and fortune and a better podcast. But other than those sure. things, I wouldn't trade sure. it for anything. <laughs> uh, this is the Wild Times Podcast, the greatest show on the air. Recently, actually just yesterday, we overtook Jay, Joe Rogan based on his yes. Uh, yes. His, prob- his problems with Spotify, which is great. It made us the number one podcast in the world yep. On our Patreon and nowhere else. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I am your host, the broologist Forrest Galante. Joining me, as always, the very lovely Retep, the Ooh, professor I got a himself. Real intro today. Yes, yeah. thank you. How are you, sir? Uh, I look. It's it's funny because this light. I'm very pale, and the lighting that I have makes me look like powder. You guys seen the movie Powder? Oh I yeah, I saw it at the theater. Very Great emotional. Movie. Very emotional yeah, I just movie. Don't have his superpowers, but um. Yeah, I'm doing great, fellas. Happy to see you. It's big, exciting things happening with the pod on the back end, and it's really, really getting my nipples hard. Love you. I like pig butts. And I cannot lie. Oh, Neil, I didn't see that part. There you go. cameraman, Neil, who wore uh, slippers to the jungle, got me this shirt. I miss Neil. We should have Neil on the pod. He oh, won't no. have much God, to yeah. say because <laughs> he's been outside yeah. once and it was with us, but... <laughs> He's but like, hey. <laughs> yeah, all right, on. and the other host, the guy who thinks that he's in the Midwest in the world's worst snowstorm that's currently happening, but he's actually in Los Angeles where it's 74 degrees, Mr. Mm-hmm. Patrick DeLuca, the producer. It's, are, like, it's like 52 in the in the San Fernando Valley of Is Los it? Angeles. Yeah. A little nippy. Yeah, and I can't bring myself to pay for, you know, heating the house all day. So oh, that's I'm with nice. you. This is... This is my heater for those that aren't on the thing. I have a tiny affordable space heater because I will <laughs> not turn the heat on in the house. And if my wife touches the thermostat, we're going to have to have a sit down conversation that's, about it. That's it. Yeah, it's over. unacceptable behavior. Yeah, so, man. Excited for be this a good one. Pod. Yeah, yeah, we have a very special guest joining us today. And I'm not going to say who it is yet because for those brosners that are tagging along, Let's be honest. Most of our audience are into the wildlife space. They're into specifically, I would say, reptiles. And (laughs) our guest today is arguably the biggest figure in sort of the reptile media space in the world, which is uh, it's pretty exciting. He did say figure. Well, can can I? Yeah, just (laughs) is figure. What's figure? Is that like a candy bar? A figure. 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 Is he from out of space? He's from out of space. <laughs> I mean, look. Yes. Not only is he a big, he's big in the space, but he owns a giant reptile zoo. Right. I, I, you know, for everyone who, like when we had Mason on, who works at a zoo, that was fun for me. He just works there. You this couldn't guy owns stop asking him questions. I thought that podcast was going to go on for seven hours. I'm like, Patrick, just, yeah. it's, he's, he's told you what the monkey enclosure is like. Be There's quiet. nothing Let him cooler in. than the behind <laughs> the scenes of a zoo, man. It's, yeah. it's really cool. I want to know more really about is. it. When I, growing up, um, sort of in between the gap of coming, becoming a biologist and like, coming to the realization that I wasn't going to run back to Africa at age 17 and become a safari guide, I figured my natural path was going to be working at a zoo. That's kind of what I thought. Like, ages like 19 to 20-ish, 22-ish, I was like, I'm going to work at a zoo. That's what I'll do with my life. And I've never had that opportunity. I've been to many zoos. You know, I've been behind the scenes in a couple. But I really know nothing about what the day-to-day at a zoo is like. So, I obviously thought... I wanted to be a zookeeper. Uh, obviously, I'm not. When you're a kid, you're not picturing that most of your day is shoveling up feces. Uh, Correct. Yeah, <laughs> you don't realize that part. No, it's like, yeah, I'm just cuddling with tigers and pandas. Um, <laughs> I was filming something a couple years ago. There's an amazing museum in Philadelphia that's an oddities museum. Um, that's so cool. it's just all the weirdest shit in the world. It's it's incredible. I'm, I'm pulling up the name because I can't remember it. It's called the the Mooter Museum. It's oh, in cool. Philly. It's amazing, by the way. It's just like like a, a taxidermied human who had a tumor that's the size of a watermelon. Like it's oh, crazy yeah. shit. Whoa. That's like, cool shit. 
yeah, like medieval torture devices and all this weird stuff. But because we were filming there, we got to do like behind the scenes and go into the bowels of the museum and see where all the shit's being done. It was amazing. It was so, I just, I like wouldn't shut the fuck up. They were like, dude, we're supposed (laughs) to be filming. Shut up. Stop talking to the museum guy. I love that about you though, Pat. That's what makes you an interesting character. You like to, you're excited for the, for things in life that normally bore the shit out of other people. So speaking, (laughs) speaking of things that people would find boring, I got the most text messages I've ever got from Patrick the past three days while he was at, <laughs> what was it, the Mineral and oh, yeah. Fossil Show in Phoenix, yeah. Arizona? I probably butchered yeah. all that. Tucson. Well, where were you? Tell us about it. I was at the Tucson Rock and Mineral Show. I okay. went because, like, I have a rock collection. Just, I, you know, I was, when I worked on Ice Cold Gold, they're, you know, one of the guys a geologist, and I just started, like, picking up cool rocks. And then I, like, gotten more into it, and I like them, and we have these shelves and whatever. So we just went to look at buy some cool specimens for the shelves. Well, you yeah. know, like you got the elephant bird egg in Madagascar at the fossil market. Yep. I didn't realize the scale of this thing. And I'm not talking about that it takes up a lot of space. I watched a negotiation and sale of a full plesiosaur. How much? I, I The price I didn't catch. But I'll gotcha. tell you that um, there were two T-Rex skulls that had already been sold. Um all, there were several fully intact mosasaurs, that, which okay. I think they're more common. What's a mosasaur? I don't know what that is. Mosasaurus? It's like a, it's pretty big. It's a, it's a sea creature. Oh, dinosaur. The thing from Jura- it's the thing from Jurassic yeah. World where they're holding the great white shark up, and it yeah. looks like a minnow, and then this thing comes up, and I thought that oh, was yeah. a plesiosaur. That is a mosasaur. That's a mosasaur. Very so cool. Ple- plesiosaur has the long neck. Got it. Got mosasaur it. is almost more like crocodilian looking. Oh um, man, I want. There was a, so. Sorry, you, you said they one. sold a skull of one of these. <laughs> yes, I want. No, no, very, very much. Several fully <laughs> intact specimens. Get out of here. Not intact. You know they've been wired together, but full yeah, yeah, yeah. specimens. Um, you know, you see like a parade of like uh, guys in like like Saudi Arabian dudes, like a full parade of them with bodyguards, mm-hmm. like going mm-hmm. into it because there's like seventy five venues. So right. some of them are like people just trading stuff that's like five million and up. There's a dinosaur venue. It's crazy, dude. That's wild. That is cool, though. I, I'm gonna say this: just looking at the pictures on Google of Mosasaurus, a lot of people are like, "I wish, I wish Megalodon was still around. I'd bring back Megalodon." Hands down, zero question. Mosasaurus is my new favorite dinosaur. <laughs> it's really think, cool. I didn't think that this was a real thing, like from Jurassic World. I thought it was just a nonsense CGI thing. This is my favorite new. Dinosaur, for sure. So, Zero question. J- just so you know, so for Jurassic World, they scaled, they made the Mosasaurus like six times bigger than it really is. It must um, be. It's it's that's nonsense. Yeah. It's like in the in the in the poster. I don't know if you've seen the poster they used with it in. The yeah. kids like standing by an aquarium wall, and the the great white shark looks like a guppy. It's right. Yeah, it's the next no. pick over, Peter. Check. Yeah. No. Just go. Yeah. Look at that. That's nonsense. Yeah. No. <laughs> Mosasaurus was like twenty that- feet long. Still That's cool. a literal battle royale creation. That's not a real thing that existed. <laughs> it is a hybrid between a crocodile and a shark, my two favorite animals, and I want it to be around now. Not to mention like the two the two animals that all they do is hunt. The two like the two most efficient predators in the world that their whole life is just like killing. Love but it. I'll tell you Love what's interesting because I was I was with Josh Feldman, friend of the show, and uh, uh-huh. his dad, who's oh, nice. a, a big gem guy, owns a big gem shop in. Uh, in Arizona and uh, it's funny there's like a market for stuff and things get hot and then they get cold right Interesting. so like right now t- everything T-Rex is off the hook so like anything T-Rex related is super hot right now Megalodon huh. is super hot so like you huh. know a, a Megalodon like a big specimen a big tooth this big yeah. is going for like five grand three years ago it would have gone for 500 bucks no way Wow. Yeah, it's it's just it's like, like anything commodities. else. It's like trading yeah. like gold or silver or something where it goes up and down based on what's what's cool. Totally. The other thing I'd say for us is that because I was just looking for like cool, like awesome crystals and rocks and shit like that. Sure. There there is a huge. I would say like a third of the rock and gem show is Ma- is stuff from Madagascar. No way. I'm not surprised there, though, to be yeah. honest. I mean, uh, and just to tell a jo- a story at Patrick's expense, real quick. I think we've told this story on the podcast before. At the beginning, not end, of our first shoot in Madagascar together, we went to this, like, 
this like flea market. What was it called? Do you remember? Um, I think really it was called matter, a fossil a fossil market. Fossil market in Antananarivo, yeah. and everybody bought one thing. I bought I bought a uh, elephant bird egg, which um, was awesome. Except Patrick, who brought one of those small size rolly suitcases of rocks. <laughs> That we then had to haul all around the country for like twelve days, and yep. then had to put on, try and get through security and put on a plane. And tell tell your story of the airport. I know we've told it on the pod before, it just, but it, it might just have been ninety work. episodes ago. I was like, oh, if I, if I wrap each of these rocks in an article of clothing, they'll never see it in the X-ray. <laughs> they immediately saw it, opened the bag, and just kind of looked at me. And I went, oh, those are just gifts because it was How right around Christmas time. <laughs> yeah, no, I said, those are just gifts because uh, it was like mid-December. And right. he said, oh, gifts, gifts for us. And I said, yeah. absolutely. And then me and three very large men went and stood in a shower stall. Um, right. Nose to <laughs> nose. Story, dude. I watched him yeah. go into this little curtain room with three guys, and I was like, "Oh, this isn't going to go well." I no. And I just gave them ten bucks each, and they were like massaging my shoulders on the way out there. <laughs> they couldn't. I think they were like going to be happy with two bucks each. Right. Um, <laughs> and I just story. was like, "Here's." I had a twenty and a ten. I was like, "Can you share this and you take this?" And they were like, "Yeah." It was great. <laughs> just got everything out. Got some great specimens. Smuggled them out. Illegally. Love it. But All yeah. right. Well, speaking of great specimens, let's do a drum roll, please. Let's get somebody very special on the pod. Yeah. Good timing. Good timing. Here he comes. Boom! There he is. Brian he Barczyk, is. the Snake Bites TV. So, Brian, we just teased our, our audience, and we're like, we've got somebody very special coming. We're not going to say his right. name. He's the, He's got a zoo. He's, like, the biggest guy in the snake world on YouTube. Wouldn't say your name. So we've been teasing you. We've been talking you up. And here you are on the wild. God, I hope I was... <laughs> I hope I don't disappoint you. It's, it's a lot of pressure you put on me here, you know? So, no, I appreciate it. It's great to see you guys. Ah, it's good to What's see up, you, man? man. Thanks for joining us on The Wild Time. So, obviously, you and I have known each other a long time. Patrick, Brian, was the executive producer of Extinct or Alive. He created the show. Oh, wow. And so, nice. yeah, him and I have known each other a really long time. And and Ratep, as you see the name in the quarter, which is just Peter spelled backwards. He's not a small Indian boy. Um, he <laughs> is How do you know? uh, our producer of the show and also our co-host. And he's your everyman. He's never left the greater Los Angeles area. He only eats wow. Taco Bell. Uh, I'll ask all the stupid questions. He that, does. That he's, you he's, guys neither of those already. things are true, but he does ask a lot of stupid questions. Uh, <laughs> oh God, I love being on this podcast. It's my favorite thing. <laughs> <laughs> but welcome, man. We're excited to have you. I know Patrick has about ten million questions about your zoo ready to yeah. go. Um, but before we dig into that, you want to intro yourself? Tell us about who you are and your life and everything else. Fun. Wow. Yeah, I mean, obviously, my name is Brian Barczyk. I've uh, been just kind of, you know, a reptile guy, really an animal guy more than anything, but uh, with a special affinity towards reptiles my whole life. I mean, that's all I've ever wanted to do. You know, I was two years old, uh, saw a ball python. Literally, I was two. I mean, I'm not kidding you. Two years old, my mom tells me um, that. And uh, I remember it like it was yesterday. I saw a ball python at a zoo. And, and, and I was hooked. That was it. That was it was the end. That was all I ever wanted to do. And growing up, uh, I, I, I love dinosaurs, obviously. So, I, you know, I love sure. you know, dinosaurs and animals were my thing. And it's all I did my whole life, you know, through school. You know, everyone thought I was a freak because all I did was want to play with animals. I, you know, during when I was younger, I, I just was in the woods constantly catching snakes. You know, we just have garter snakes up here in Michigan. But, um, yeah, so, so that turned into... One thing after another, and as you know, as a wildlife biologist, it's a, it's a weird world, right? Like, as far as you don't Very, start yeah. in one path, you go this way, then you go that way, then you go this way, and then, and then all, but ultimately the zoo was what I wanted, right? You know, I mean, everyone, I, I want to either work at a zoo or, or run my own zoo, and that's the dream, and, and finally that dream kind of came, it was a long road. But that dream yeah, finally Jesus. came true. We opened up the reptarium, and and uh, and and it's been it's you know listen when I, I started to work on opening up the reptarium, uh, everyone told me I was an idiot for opening up in Michigan. They're like, do it in L.A., do it in Florida, do it in sure. Texas, New York, sure. and um, 
what, what I, and, and, and listen, I, I didn't know, maybe I was, an, was an idiot for doing it. I had no idea, but I was like, no, nah, this is where I'm from. Even though I've spent a ton of time out in SoCal and a ton of time in Florida and all over the world for that matter. Um, this is where my home is. This is where my family is. And, and we did it. And the one thing that I guess I didn't even realize is that the advantage of doing it here was there's no competition. There's nothing mm-hmm. else like it. You know, <laughs> in California, yeah. you guys got all kinds of cool stuff. Florida, there's a million wildlife things. Texas, there's a million wildlife things. And uh, and so Michigan just worked out really well. And from the day we opened up, it just was a huge hit, you know, and it blew That's me away. Great. I mean, blew me away. It's like we, we sell tickets in advance. Wow. Uh, yeah. And uh, and, and we're, we're sold out every single, every time we're open. You know, we're no That's way. amazing. That's incredible. Well, so, how does... Okay, so let's say I, I'm like, oh, I want to be a TV producer because I'm bored living in upstate New York. All right, I'll get in the car, move to L.A., and just hang out around then, just trying to figure that out. How do, Opening a zoo is not like, how do you go from not having a zoo to having exactly. a fully <laughs> operational zoo packed <laughs> full of question. amazing animals? Well, you know, the good news was I had been, you know, keeping animals a lot of crazy stuff. So a lot of the animals, right. not all of but probably about 70% of the animals that we you know, filled the zoo up with, you know, we're, I already had, you know, so that, that helped me a lot. And that was, I mean, you know, I, I tell people all the time, like to do it well, takes a lot of money, right? Yeah. You know, that's the thing, you sure. know, you know, you can open up and I didn't want it. I never wanted to do it halfway. You know, I wanted the enclosures to feel, I not only wanted the enclosures sure. to feel naturalistic, but I wanted the, inv- I wanted, I always say like, I wanted to mix reptile zoo meets, Rainforest Cafe, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. So when you walk That's through the door, such a cool visual, exhibit. by the way. Reptile yeah. Zoo. So I I moved to America it's, when I was fourteen, and I don't I don't mean yeah. to kill your story, but my favorite place to go when I was fourteen years old was the Rainforest Cafe because it was like an yeah. experience while you were eating your French fries, right? Yeah. And so to have exactly. like snakes crawling out of that while you're eating your French fries and around your neck is like the coolest idea ever. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's <laughs> what it was about, you know. And listen, really, the the idea was to build a place that I wanted to go to when I was a kid, period. And that's what yeah, we're doing now. We're, we're actually in the process right now. We're, we're in the, you know, past approval process in the pre-construction phase of a $4 million expansion. Wow. Uh, and, 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 and we're adding an aquarium to, to, to the zoo as well. And, um, and, and it's, it's scary as heck. I'm not going to lie. It str- stresses me out every minute of every day that I'm, <laughs> I'm going to spend all my money. But, uh, but I don't care about the money. You know, to me, the money means nothing. It's building a dream. And, and so, again, I love fish and I still love fish. So I want to build the next iteration of what I wanted to do when I was a kid. And actually, ironically enough, one of the expansion parts is what we're, we're calling it the Utica dig site because we're in Utica, Michigan, mm-hmm. right outside of Detroit. And uh, it's going to be a place where you can, like, dig for fossils. Cool. And, nice. And, and That's stuff awesome. Stuff like that, you know. And, and because I'm, I'm building all these things that I wanted to do as a kid and still at my age still want to do, you know. And so right. uh, so how do you do it? Uh, number one, you got to be a little crazy. you got to work a lot. You've got to put a lot on the line. You've got to uh, have – enough money to to be stupid about spending and and, uh, <laughs> yeah. and then just hope for the best you know yeah it's so exciting that. man that's so cool i mean you are living the dream I, I remember telling patrick when we first started shooting the show i mean he said to me he was like you know if this show's a huge success and you can do this for 10 years and make a bunch of money what would you do next and i said to patrick i'd start a little zoo and aquarium you know like an yeah. endangered species zoo and aquarium that yeah. did you know Good at good animal outreach and did a bunch of conservation work for reintroduction. And I'm nowhere near that goal. I mean, you are living the dream of all of us wildlife nerd guys. I mean, that's so cool. <laughs> no, I, I, I oh, sorry, go ahead. True. Go ahead. I'm go ahead. Go ahead. No, so I was just gonna ask, like, obviously, like you have this huge zoo happening, and you also have this huge online presence. Again, I'm the layman, so bear with me. <laughs> to me, like looking at somebody who has as big of a following as you. I'm like so curious because you're so passionate about this, this other endeavor that you have and you've somehow made it all work together to like also, you know, build this thing that take that some people just can never do. Like, right. I, how did you how did how did these things come together and how did you figure out, oh, like this is huge? Yeah, you know, it's all like a symbiosis, right? Like I don't do really anything that doesn't evolve around animals. And so, like, it all, like, every piece of the puzzle 
fits together, right? They're all clogs in a bigger wheel, right? Like the mm-hmm. social following helps the zoo. The zoo helps the social following. That helps the next project. It helps my product lines. It helps my merchandising. It helps everything kind of works together, you know? And so I don't really go outside of my comfort zone. I know I know it's, you know, it's weird because I, I, we, I'm all over the place. I have all kinds of things happening. Well, I said one time I went out of my comfort zone with a product. <laughs> it was a drinking game. And, uh, <laughs> and now you have our attention. Right. The weird, the weird thing is, is that uh, I, I don't drink. So that's even weirder, right? But I, I, I actually uh, designed, manufactured, patented, and uh, and put out, uh, a, a started to put out a drinking game. And ironically enough, it was just as the pandemic hit. So uh. really... Really bad timing for a drinking game, uh, but that, so so it was obviously. I, I think I put about a hundred thousand dollars into this drinking game, and uh, I have like ten thousand of these these things that we call the tipster, by the way. And uh, and, and so that was a that was a bad move, maybe. But I well, still think it's, I, I think there's still opportunity after the pandemic the, to maybe the rewatch. Fact that you're sure, on sure, this sure. podcast right now, our fan base. They love to drink. So oh, they're going to buy it. it yeah, if you want to get rid of those 10,000, 10, drop, drop a plug for it right now. We're it, it's a guarantee, by the way. That is a guarantee. We have nothing but alcoholic animal listeners. That is, that is, our, that is our niche. It is a small niche, but we are there. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, that's good stuff. Yeah, it's, it's pretty fun. But regardless of the drinking game, uh, I, I, I stay within my, my – my, so even the drinking game was interesting because I can't. So let me tell you what it is real quick because you guys are everyone's going to be like, what the hell is this thing? Yeah, that's yeah, fun. Picture, I see a picture on World Star, I believe it is, or a video. I'm sorry, of World Star of a guy doing this with like three or four solo cups, and they're water falling. This solo cup's water falling into this solo cup, water falling into this solo cup into his mouth. Right. Impressive. So yeah. I think there's got to be a product that you have a handle where solo cups and you can stack as many solo cups out. You can do 12 solo cups and now you can actually do it. And that's why it's called the tipster, right? Tip, 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 tip. Got it. And, uh, yeah. and even though I'm not passionate about drinking and I'm not passionate about, uh, uh, you know, trying to convince other people to binge drink, uh, <laughs> if you want to, but, uh, uh, it was, it was still a passion of mine to develop some cause I had never developed something outside the animal world. And I thought, you know, what better way to do it than to, to, to do this. And, and uh, so I was passionate about it, but, but really animals is all I've ever cared about and yeah, wanted yeah. to do. And, and um, so, so my, my I long-winded is that it, it all works together. Yeah. yeah. You know, and I that don't know sense. that any of it works without the other, right? And that's why we just keep on adding little more clogs to the wheel that help it all churn, right? Yeah. 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 That so, makes Brian, sense. This, is, this is a tough one for our audio only, so maybe you, you can uh, describe it a little bit. But I remember following you on social media, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm going to say six, seven years ago when you got your first tattoo. Now you have the Jungle Book sleeves. Uh, And (laughs) I hope that's not insulting, but you guys that aren't seeing this, I mean, it's like the dopest animal murals down both of his arms. And I remember literally on social being like, nice, dude, when you got your first, what was it, a python tattoo, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, right. and uh, and now you're just like, you're full, got these super cool yeah. animal scenes. Show us, show, show them off a little. So, so yeah, so I, I'll explain as well. So this, so first off, my tattooer is, uh, is a guy named Bob Tyrell. He's a world famous tattoo guy, uh, probably top two or three in the world when it comes to, to, to wildlife, or cool. not wildlife, but but black and gray portraits. He, he, yeah. Like I said, he's an absolute legend, and I'm really fortunate to, to have him. And so my right arm here that I just showed you is at Africa. It right. goes all the way up my sleeve, onto my thing, and onto my chest. And I have a leopard actually on my chest. Oh, nice. Oh, um, sick. I didn't know that one. Yeah, yeah. So I have the big five and, and a whole bunch of other stuff. And then this arm is started is Australia. So you know, got a, 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 a you know a, a saltwater croc Salty. here, cassowary. Mm-hmm. Uh, got a, a, a lace monitor. <laughs> nice. Got you know, so a parenti, Got a whole bunch of stuff. So got a, a, a colca right here, right? You know, so um, so oh, this cool. will be Australia. And we kind of stopped the process because again the pandemic hit, and I didn't really feel comfortable having a guy breathing on me for twelve hours while he was tattooing. And um, but but I'm ready to get started now. I'm ready to get back to it, finish out the sleeve, and then 
I'm like you said. I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of go. You know, I, I you you may learn through this podcast. I'm a little obsessive, so uh, <laughs> so so, uh, so uh, I'll uh, I'm the guy that you yeah, had no tattoos and then sleeved up. You know, yeah. like, right, right, right. Yeah. Sleeve. Zero to sixty. Um, but you know, I'll probably do like Asia on my back and then just kind of and on my legs. I did start uh, on my legs. I started my animals at my zoo. So, That's uh, cool. so nice. I'll probably do that, and I'll just kind of be covered in cool animal portraits. That, but but t- t- so my arms and my chest will be done by Bob Tyrell. The rest of my body, I'm tattoo collecting from other famous tattooers. Oh, that's cool. So, so, so yeah, so, you know, guys, I mean, you know, Paul Ackard, and, I mean, the list goes on. I mean, you know, obviously, you know, Paul Booth, you know, all these guys. And thankfully, because Bob is friends with all these famous tattooers, guys that you can't get in with, I can get in with them because he's he's my connection. So, nice. So, yeah, I'll, I'll, one day I'll be, like, neck to, to, to toe tattoos. <laughs> body suit. That's kind of cool. Tattoo. Well, sorry, well, that kind of t- took no, us off track, but I, I just remember, I, I mean, for the years that we've been friends, I've been watching your tattoo evolution, and I literally <laughs> remember your first tattoo, and I was like, oh, that's cool, and now you're yeah. just like, boom, man, it's crazy, yeah. but anyway, yeah. um, so, yes. I got, I got a question I'm dying to ask. Do I got it. I got it. All right, so let's say someone comes, they're standing outside your, your reptarium, and they're like... I hate animals. I, I, there's not there's nothing cool about animals. And you had to show them one thing in your zoo to get them to be like, "Holy shit, I love animals now." <laughs> what what's the coolest well, thing you would show a kid or or someone like that? So it's a, it's a great question, you know, and I I think it, you know, I would probably so I only have two mammals at my place. Although we're adding obviously, you know, fish with the aquarium and we are adding small cloud river otters uh, with this next expansion too so we'll have three sets but I think I would stick reptile because that's what you know I I really love as a matter of fact at at my place the thing I love the most is every weekend we do get people that come in that are like maybe their kids really passionate loves reptiles but they hate them and they'll walk through the door and tell me like I I do not like reptiles don't get me and I always say two things I always say I'm going to do this at your pace so I'm not going to throw anything on you. I'm not going to make you hold anything, but I'm going to probably bet 90% by the time you leave this place, you're going to hold a snake. Mm-hmm. And nice. they'll be like, nope, ain't going to happen. 99% of the time it happens because right, I always call it the Jones effect. So with that being said, I would probably <laughs> stick with reptile, and I'd probably even maybe stick snake, to be honest with you. And there's two snakes in particular that usually break people in my place. Can we the guess? That- Can we guess? Go for it. Okay. Peter, you don't even know what a snake is, but you, you go first. Taipan. <laughs> no, we wouldn't guess. do that. Wouldn't I do don't it. think <laughs> he'll be doing that. Okay, yeah, give one more guess. He said afraid. two snakes. snakes. Give, can you name another I think, snake? I think it's going to be one of the rainbow snakes. Oh, okay. Interesting. I'm going with the uh, age-old classic Michigan garter snake. Oh, there you go. Because he <laughs> heard about there. it 30 minutes ago. I, used to, um, I caught him. I'm from the Midwest, too. We had him, too. I'm yep. going to say you go with... A Burmese python, big mm. standard berm, and mm, something beautiful, and a milk snake. I'm going to say those oh. are your two. So I, l- I love all of your, your – none of your, your answers are wrong. They're all great. <laughs> they, they all would be Except great. Taipan. But, uh, that was a pretty stupid answer. <laughs> Nobody's taipan, holding taipans. Yeah. <laughs> Which, by the way, taipans are – coastal taipans in particular, most mental snakes I've ever dealt with in my entire life. Dude, so. I got a story <laughs> about that. Yeah, for sure. Oh. But please continue. <laughs> so, But, no, there's two snakes in my zoo that are actually – one is actually a no-eyed – it was born without eyes – albino ball python. Uh, so, so, uh, she, the, the, and the thing about it is the fact that uh, because she doesn't have eyes, people feel a little bit better about it. Oh, interesting. Huh. Interesting. So, so people are like, oh, she's not looking at me, so she can't bite me, so I'm, I feel more comfortable, right? Hmm. Two uh, is actually, and, this, and the, I'm telling these two snakes are always the two snakes people hold out of all my stuff. And there's one that's a reticulated python that's about 12 foot that's black and white. Beautiful black and white. I like, am almost surprised like about that. I am those, very yeah. surprised. They are shitheads. I'm sorry, but retics are typically in the large python family. They're shitheads. Like yeah. anacondas are nicer. Yeah. Berms are nicer. Nicer. Yeah. The only only large python that's maybe worse than retics, from my experience, and I'd love to hear your opinion on this, Brian. Is is African rock pythons? They're they're the only ones <laughs> I think are shittier than uh, than than retics. But yeah, no. Please yeah. continue. 
No, I agree with you. And, and listen, I, you know, uh, retics are typically that way. The ones that we have are unbelievably docile. And this huh. particular one, her name is Perdita, by the way. She is just something else. And, and you'll have a, someone that comes in that is terrified. I mean, just terrified. And then all of a sudden uh, they see Perdita and they're like, all right, I'll hold her. And she's yeah. a 12 foot snake. And I'm like, wow. so your first snake you're ever going to touch when you tell me you're afraid of snakes <laughs> is a 12-foot python. And they're like, yep, and that's the snake. I, I, 99% of people hold either the albino ball python with no eyes or Perdita for the first time. And I tell you what, very few people get out of my place without holding something. Um, love that. That's just the way it is. It, it, and we, 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 I love the feeling of getting someone from, oh, my gosh, this isn't this – isn't, uh, something to be afraid of. I love this. So it's that's, really cool. It's crazy, Brian, because that's the same thing I've heard Peter's girlfriend say, where she was just like, there's no way I'm touching that thing. And now she's like, you know, I love it. <laughs> why it, why it, would she like say that. that to you is my question. Why? I, I Wait, don't worry about our conversations. You worry about you and, and making that one-eyed snake more appealing. I, so Brought me uh, into the exactly. combo. I, I can't help it. Got to defend. Gotta defend. <laughs> uh, I love it. I love it. That's she calls my blind you, snake, by the way. I just want to say. Forest. Yes, no, that's... <laughs> That's, that's very smart. Uh, that's cool, Brian. That's I find that really interesting that you're able to break through those barriers with such unusual animals, especially the yeah. eyeless ball python. I think that's yeah. that never would have occurred to me in a million years. Ball python, sure, but the fact that the the eyes thing makes a difference, I find that really, really interesting. It, it really does. It's like people are like, oh, she can't see me, so she's not going to bite me, so I'll hold this one. It's so, it's again, it's a it's a wild thing. She's one of my most popular animals by far, and. Uh, uh, yeah, but but I, it, other than that, the other the one animal that is really crazy, I'm sure that you've seen them and messed with them in the past. Uh, we have a six-banded armadillo yeah. that is absolutely the most fre- – it's like a puppy dog. It chases you around. It, yep. it wants to just hang out on you. Uh, Crawl they on don't you. Ball- yeah, mm-hmm. they don't ball up like the three bandits, so they're they're in their twenty pounds, so they're much bigger than right. most of the armadillos, and uh, that's probably fast becoming one of the most favorite. I mean, people will come to our place just to spend time with and his name's Brillo the armadillo, <laughs> and, uh, and, and people say so, and it's just crazy. So, uh, but uh, but yeah, there's there's so many. I mean, uh, obviously my albino alligator, she's only about. Five, four and a half, five footish, um, but dog tame. I mean, you know, I can yeah. put her in any, anyone's hands that walks through the door. With you know, obviously we, we take precaution, but but she's she's amazing. And yeah, there's Brillo right there. He's so cute. <laughs> oh my He's god, the that's cutest. the cutest yeah. thing I've ever seen. So let's let's flip this on its head. And Brian, you know, the last thing in the world I'm ever trying to do is villainize or demonize any animals. Yeah. But yeah. I say that to say this: nobody who does what you and I do for a living. Has, yeah. has ever escaped a really close call. So tell yeah. us, tell us a story of one of your closest calls. So weirdly enough, it wasn't a reptile. And, and, and I'm sure you're just like I am, Forrest, that like when you're in the moment and something is happening, you don't feel it's a close call. It's, it's of course. in retrospect. Yeah. You look back and go, wow, that yeah. could have really been bad. But weirdly 100%. enough, much like you, I've traveled all over the world. I've caught coastal taipans i've caught black mambas i've you know uh, king cobras i've been you know uh, to komodo i you know done the whole thing yeah and, and never believe it or not i can't ever recall one moment with a reptile that i thought was a close call but mm-hmm. i was mm-hmm. a, on a, a shoot in 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 africa in a place called jakutu which is is right by the kruger and okay. uh we were, we were doing a, a piece on rhinos and I was with a, a, a ranger there uh, right, named Rich Sessions, and, and he was a great guy, by the way. And we were you know, walking and, and doing a little, t- and much like you know when you're shooting, you're shooting a piece five times, right? People don't understand that. You don't shoot yep. it once, you shoot it because you got different angles. And, and so what the deal was is there was a group of five rhinos that were like kind of, they were number one downwind. We know that they don't have good eyesight. They use their smell mainly. So they were downwind from us. And, um, and we, we would walk up on this, this little patch of bushes, and they were on the other side of the bushes, and we would talk about rhino conservation, right? He, that's right. what he was all about, is rhino conservation. Sure. And, um, and so we, the fifth time we did this from the last angle, and it was going to be a drone shot this time, is um, the rhinos came out from behind the bush. Like, they came uh-huh. towards us. And this is a pretty open field. I mean, we got probably 100 yards of just, you know, some bush and straight land, right? And at first, the rhinos are maybe 
25 feet away from us. And they're obviously very curious, right? And they're walking towards us and we're slowly walking back and, and Rich has been around these things forever. So he's doing the little like, you know, like, so they, hey, Slopes. we're here. Yep. 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 We're here, but very lightly. Now he has a rifle on his back, right? Never touches that rifle the entire time. Never touches yep. it. And after this situation is done, I said, would you have ever thought about shooting? He said, I'd rather have died than shoot those rhinos. So so yep. he, that rifle was there just for, for play or something. But regardless, <laughs> by the time we're backing up and backing up, at one point, the rhinos are now to the point where I can touch their nose if I wanted to. They're literally oh, feet wow. away from us. That's scary. And we got five gigantic rhinos coming. And I had a, a camera guy named Russ that was uh, shoots with BBC and Nat Geo and stuff like that. He was shooting from long distance with a long lens. And, um, and, and, and so when they finally got pretty close to us, Rich just did a little bit of a louder, like one, bam, clap, and they ran off. And, uh, and, and when we got back, uh, Russ and my other camera guy both said, we thought 100% we were filming you get killed. Oh, you know, oh not wow. because Wait, was, not it, because was this Russell McLaughlin, that Russ? That's Russ, exactly. Oh, I you, could yeah. totally, I, I, I've known Russ a while. If he, yeah. he would not, there's no, he would have been like, yep, um, if this guy gets flattened, I'm filming it. I'm not stepping in. I'm not helping. I will stay right here behind the camera. No question. That, that, yep, that's exactly. He was happy to film it. And he thought, he, he, I used to probably think like, I'm going to get some good footage here. Totally, again, it totally. That, and it wasn't that the rhinos were mean or trying to, they were just curious. But again, we we're so close that if they would have ran towards us, we would have been trampled and we would have been yeah. dead for sure. So sure. that was the only time that I, and, and the only other time that I think I've came close to death in my entire life, which by the way, I've again, been working with, with animals uh, for 35 years and, and I've never even been to knock on wood. I haven't been to the hospital one time ever. Oh wow. You know, for wow. anything. And, and we, shot, you know, we shot Discovery Channel, we shot Venom Hunters, which I was yep. traveling Africa and Australia, catching the most deadly snakes on the planet. And I never came close, never been bit by a venomous snake, never been hurt, never stitches, never anything. Um, the, so the, so the, the rhino was, look, in retrospect, during the time, I thought it was amazing. I was like, this is awesome. They're getting closer <laughs> to me. This is great. Um, and I wasn't even thinking about the footage. I was just thinking about the experience. The experience, totally. Sure. Yep. And then the only other time I came close to getting killed was actually by a person in Africa. But that's a whole other story we won't get into. <laughs> uh, but, I've been there, yeah. man. They're way... I say this all the time. I say it on the show. I say it on the podcast. That is the biggest variable and the most dangerous thing. It's always the people. It's never the yep. animals. A hundred percent. Yep. A hundred percent. Oh, somebody's animal. Is that yours, Brian? Yes. Yeah. What's that's he saying? Yeah, that's my, my <laughs> dog. I've got a, a German Shepherd and a Great Dane, and my wife is trying to keep them in check a little bit here. I, I was, I, I could have done it for my office back at the shop, but uh, All I good, decided man. to come home. Hey, this is an animal <laughs> podcast. If we didn't have a couple dogs barking, my guinea fowl are usually outside of my office causing a ruckus, and I have to go on mute like at least once a podcast to make sure <laughs> that it doesn't sound like the African savanna in here. So no problem. I love, yeah, love guinea <laughs> How fowl. How many? Brian, how many employees do you have at the uh, zoo? Uh, roughly, I think we're up. To, I think we're up. Yeah, it's a good. I got to say roughly because I never really quite know. I think we're up to about seventeen people now uh, that work for us. Uh, three of them are are, are full time animal educators, so all they do is you know educational shows, uh, and then there's um, uh, keepers and and uh, social media people and sure. and uh, all that other stuff. Run so me I think through. We have, I think we're at. I think we're at 17 Sorry? run me through the what is the because every kid like when I, I i went i had three halloweens in a row because the outfit still fit me where i went as a zookeeper <laughs> what is this run me through the Ritep, realities you got nothing, hold on hold on Ritep, you got no jab at him being meager with the fact that for three halloweens in a row his zookeeper outfit fit him well, I mean, it doesn't need to be said. Yeah, okay. knows it, <laughs> it goes without saying. Okay, copy. <laughs> run me through the day to day. They clock in. What are they doing? Your entry level zookeeper, not your not your best guy or girl, but your your you know it's their first week on the job. What does a zookeeper do? So yeah, we have different different levels. You know, we obviously have guys that work with uh, so so you know we have people that work with a little bit more sketchy stuff. You know that yeah. are have been with me for years. Um, you know, if someone walks through the door, they're probably doing. They're probably doing the most mundane things, quite honestly, like the, the you know cleaning poop. They're uh, cleaning glass. Uh, yeah. They're maybe chopping lettuce and and veggies for the the, the herbivores. Um, they're probably not getting. I, you know, I don't think many people that when we start a keeper probably for the first 
few months isn't doing much with with the actual hands-on animal stuff. You know, we really have to, and even then it takes, you know, uh, probably a year before I would let them touch something that I felt was was dangerous. And then and then we also have really strict policies about with the animals, you know, large pythons and large monitors and, and crocodilians that um, you have to have two people at all time. You know, like there's never one person dealing with them without someone right there with them. So, but yeah, in the beginning, it's like, you know, listen, it's it's glor it's a glorified poop cleaning job, really, right? You know, <laughs> you're just cleaning a lot of poop every day, and you're feeding. And, you know, the feeding part's fun. I mean, the feeding part's yeah. a fun thing, but but the the poop cleaning way outweighs anything else you're going to do as a zookeeper. Yep, yep. that is Understood. what we were talking about earlier. Yeah, uh, exactly. Do you have crocodile monitors? I do. Yeah. And? Yeah. They're scared. They scare listen. the hell out of me, Brian. I'm not scared of a lot of wildlife, but and I love monitors, by the way. Varanids are, like, very near the top of my list. Every country I go to, I try and catch all the varanids I can, just yeah. even though it's just, like, fiddling with them for the sake of fiddling with them. I just love dealing with varanids. Crocodile monitors scare the hell out of me. Peter, while he's telling us about them, They're could you cool mind pulling up wow. a picture of their jaws or their mouth so people can understand these animals? But sure. Brian, yeah, and, yeah and, please. And, and Peter, if you can find a, maybe even after you find a picture, see if you can find the picture. There's a picture out there of a skull between a uh, Komodo dragon and a crocodile monitor. The oh, skull. interesting. And, and people will see the difference of how they think a Komodo dragon is so dangerous. Right. And you, when you see the difference of teeth with a crocodile monitor to a Komodo dragon, ridiculous yeah uh, and i agree with you i always say forrest when people come in i say the most dangerous animal i have in this place is my crocodile monitor. no way mm -hmm. i'm glad to hear that i'm not the only one that feels that way i um, say it all the time now now ours we just have one uh it's a male and he's pretty uh -huh. big uh, uh -huh. and, and he's he's chilling out pretty good when we got him he was a year old captive hatch uh from indonesia and it was it was in the country for a year. It came in as a baby, and it was very, very aggressive. I mean, yeah. I should say defensive, very defensive. Mm -hmm. Would bite like, and you 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 know did not want to get bit. I mean, it's, you get bit by a crocodile monitor, you're going to the hospital every, every time. time, every time, every time. <laughs> and no I have, by the way, because they look a lot like uh, what's the spotted varanid that's in the same range as them. Um, Oh, I'm blanking think, on it. The mangroves or, or which one? Which it might one? be. I, I, Varanus, uh, is it Salvador? No, Salvador is crocodile Oh, monitor. yeah, so yeah, so the water monitors, yeah. The water monitors. Anyway, yeah. I've chased these things around, like Borneo and a few other places, and then yep. got right up to them and be like, no, I'm too scared, I'm too scared, I'm too scared, because they're just, like, so gnarly. They're so fearsome. Oh. But anyway, yeah, yeah, I mean, sorry, they're, please they're continue. Rapid. Yeah, they're raptors. I mean, they are literally, they're, they're one of, I think, the most smart and reactive monitor lizard in the world. Um, and, and they have the teeth to back it that are absolutely ridiculous. And uh, again, some people say they're the largest monitor lizard in the world, even though Komodos are certainly the heaviest body. But there's rumors of, of crocodile monitors with their long tail, again, not nearly as heavy bodied as a Komodo, but there's there's rumors of, of 12 foot specimens. And we know that there's at least 10 foot specimens that have been in wow. captivity of crocodile monitors. And we know that Komodos get about 10 foot. So it's, it's, yeah. a, it's a debate whether Komodos or crocodile monitors are the longest lizard in the world because of that long, long tail that, that the crocodile monitors have. No doubt that Komodo dragons are the largest as far as body and, and stuff like that and head size mm -hmm. and so like that but croc monitors are no joke now thankfully we've worked with this croc monitor for a few years now and have got it to the point where we can take it out and, and it won't bite us uh but but only me and the my monitor guy i have a guy that specializes in monitors that works with our stuff and and we we target train all of our monitor lizards and uh, only he and, and myself are able to go in that enclosure so wow. if someone else, say say that young keeper that Patrick was asking about week two is like, oh, I know animals, and he decides to let himself into the croc monitor's enclosure, what's going to happen? Walk us through how, what's your croc monitor's name? Uh, it's Baby Cush because uh, <laughs> the guy that, that raised it was named Stephen Cush. Got it. Not, so, because, not because of the weed Cush. Sure, <laughs> sure, sure. So what would Baby Cush do if a, if a foreigner came into his enclosure? You know, I, I think, to be honest, I think that he wouldn't, he would probably be very, oh, here we go, some teeth, yeah, things you can see. Um, Crazy. Uh, he would, he would, 
I don't think he would bite them, but he would definitely, they're very standoffish, probably whip them with his tail uh, mm-hmm. for sure and, and, and be very huffy and puffy because uh, it's a very untrusting animal. Uh, like I said, we yeah. built a rapport for a long time uh, with, with him. Uh, and, and, but it would, I would, I would, I don't know what I would do if a keeper did that personally. Like that would be <laughs> yeah. the bigger question. It's like, I, <laughs> I, I don't, you know, I mean, I have to have unbelievable trust with my, my keepers uh, because they, they care for, I, I mean, these animals aren't just exhibits. These animals are my pets. They're my love of my life. Every animal, I'll give you an example. You talked about water monitors, which, by the way, I chase water monitors, not crocodile monitors, but water monitors around uh, I- outside of Jakarta uh, mm-hmm. once. And, and I spent the, in the in, and, and, Can we just, sorry, can I just interrupt you for one second? When Pete, when you make that statement, the Brosners that don't know what we're talking about, they're imagining this beautiful jungle and these water monitors in these crystal clear streams. And I know this because I've chased them around Jakarta myself. You are in literal sewer drainages where that are open air, full of like feces and Yum, and like yuck. discarded bottles and plastic bags. And then here sits this gorgeous six foot long water monitor. And you're like, well, the only way I'm catching him is to get knee deep in some yuck yuck. And uh, <laughs> am I not right, Brian? Is, is that you, not how you, you caught just- yours? We must have caught him in the same spot because. That's <laughs> what I but actually, I shouldn't say caught him because I didn't catch him. I actually chased. There was about six adults, you know, five six footers, and I chased them around for, I'd say, a good four hours. You know, I chase one, wow. it jump in the water. I go after it, disappear. I would chase another one, get in the water, it would disappear. And I never. I think one time I got a hand on a tail. And they're then it tough. disappeared. So they're they really are tough. very, very tough. But but um, but they're 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 amazing. But uh, but we so we, we target train all ours so that they kind of take away that 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 food drive that they have and the scare drive. And I always say you know, the way to work a reptile the best is 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 when you they're not afraid of you and you're not afraid of them. You know that's sure. that's what you got to get this this relationship where they have zero fear of you. That's why croc monitors are much more reactive. And even our baby Kush is. Um, uh, it's still reactive. You know, he still doesn't like when we, when we open the enclosure, even if it's me or Bruce, you know, he still has that like, kind of like, what are you going to do? You know? Yeah. And they're so smart. They are, I mean, again, you, you look at their pupils, their pupils are dilating like birds. You know, they're Crazy. not like, like a normal reptile. I mean, I've never seen wow. anything like it, but, uh, do they, really respond, cool. do they respond ahead, to Patrick. eye contact quite a bit? Yeah, there's no doubt about it. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. You know, if it, it's you know, you, you know, again, we do eye contact. As a matter of fact, it's funny because uh, I, I, I am. I train my alligators a certain way, which is exactly the opposite way of you should train it. And, and <laughs> a, a, a really good crocodilian guy told me one time, you know, if you do something wrong, a train an animal wrong. Just make sure you always train it wrong instead right. of changing. The, so <laughs> right, just consistency right, right, right. is that's how I learned how to sing. Yeah, and play guitar. <laughs> You're good at it. That's yeah. this year so. Uh, but uh, uh, but I'll so key. I'll do it like this thing where I look at my alligators like they have to keep eye contact on me, and that's how I keep them calm, which is the a- exact opposite of what most crocodilian people. And that's because I didn't know. I thought this yeah. is the way you train an alligator or a crocodile. Um, so so yeah. So I think eye contact can definitely be something that can either go for you or go against you, depending on how much time and training you put into it. What uh, what you you mentioned target training? I, I can yeah, context, I was, I was try wondering about that out, too. What what exactly is that? So what we do is we take a, a, a depending on the animal a colored ball, an actual racket ball, either blue or red, on the end of a stick, and they have to actually touch that ball before we give them food. So and it does oh. two things. Number one, it allows us to move them wherever we want because they'll follow that ball for food. Right? It's a food response. It's a, you know right, just a right. response thing. And, and then the second thing it does is it, it, it means that no ball, no food, so they never think ah. fingers are food. Wow. So That's it takes cool. away the food drive. So so people get bit by reptiles for two reasons. Two feeding reasons response, only. Feeding response uh, and feeding, feeding response. response. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Feeding response. And or really if, if the animal is afraid of you. So if you can take away the fear and you take away the feeding response, you have very little chance of getting bit. And that's gotcha. what we go Interesting. for. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Would you would you uh, let for, oh sorry Forrest. Go ahead, man. No, I you go you first. I was gonna I just want to know, topic, would so you, you let first. Forrest if Forrest comes down or comes up there to visit, would you let him in the enclosure with you? Hundred percent. He could cut. If Forrest comes, he could do anything he wants. 
That's well, why we're buddies, him... Brian. By yeah, the way, I wouldn't ask to do that because I'm so scared of these animals, and I'm not <laughs> particularly scared of any animal. But croc <laughs> monitors are—they're a different animal, man. And so I was gonna say two things. First of all, I want to tell a story. Or first of all, I want to ask you this, Brian. Do you think? And I'll give you my opinion after this. Do you think croc monitors are the closest representations of like living dinosaurs? I, I always say they're living raptors. They are raptors. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I don't know genetically how close they are, but. Uh, oh, but that's what I mean. Far, yeah, yeah. Yeah, as far as like what I think, when I envision a dinosaur, when I envision a dinosaur, I think of croc monitor more than any other animal on the planet. Well, maybe cassowaries, but but that's you know, <laughs> cassowary, yeah, that's a right? good one. Cassowaries <laughs> yeah. is a good one. Um, I think that maybe paleosuchus. No, I think crocodiles, as in like saltwater crocodiles and Nile crocodiles, yeah. feel very close yeah. to that as well. They just yeah. haven't changed yeah, in right. so long. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah anyway, you're right about that too. That you're 100 percent right. But I think croc monitors are, like you said, they're like raptors. By the way, it's like you see a crocodile in a pond, you're like, I'm fine, right? He's over there. Yeah. He's in a pond. You're like <laughs> up in a canopy with a croc monitor. You're in trouble. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They, call them, they call them tree dragons over there. That's I know, I know. It's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. And they're yeah. uh, they're in Papua, which is a place we talk about a lot, PNG and West Papua, because of our thylacine yeah. um, interest. But anyway, yeah. so I want to tell you a story, and I want to get your take on it. So I'm mm-hmm. buddies with the head reptile keeper at the Santa Barbara Zoo, where I live, right? It's a beautiful facility. Santa Barbara is not a very big zoo, not a very big place, but great, beautiful facility. And he has prehensile-tailed skinks. Um mm-hmm. And he, his statement, so a lot of people, for context, for everybody listening, say that prehensile skinks are basically not trainable. They're too stupid, or they just don't respond well, whatever. Call it what you like. And I'd like to hear your take on that, Brian. Now, my buddy at the Santa Barbara Zoo, who I won't name in case he doesn't like the way I frame the story, um, <laughs> he has a different idea, which is that they do not respond to food-based training. They respond to something else. And he says that they are incredibly clever, contrary to what a lot of people say. And what he has figured out, and I've seen him do this in person, so I know it's real, is he gives positive reinforcement through behavioral enrichment that is direct contact with the sun. And it's absolutely amazing. So when I was with him, he's like, let me show you this thing. So he goes to their enclosure, he offers them some food, nothing. They don't budge. They're not interested. They, they look at him like he's a jerk, and they go back to snoozing, right? Then he puts down the food, goes and grabs a little tiny harness, like a little varanid harness, and holds it up, and both of the prehensile-tailed skinks come and line up, and he literally wow. holds it up like a little sweater, and each one puts <laughs> its leg through the loop. I swear to God, I am not joking. He buckles it on them, puts the little leash on, and puts his hand out, and they come out. He walks We live in Santa Barbara. It's sunny every single day. He walks outside of the the reptarium, which is like 10 feet, and holds them in the sun, and they sit there like my dog does on a warm day on the driveway (laughs) with his belly to the sun, and it's this expression of pure joy on their face, (laughs) and he does that for like five or 10 minutes and then takes them back inside, and they literally go back inside begrudgingly, lift each leg out of the harness, and go back to their spots. And wow. he's just like, I've cracked a code that nobody knows about, which is that you absolutely can train prehensile-tailed skinks. They're just not food-motivated. They're motivated by another type of positive reinforcement. And in this case, it's going and lounging in the sun. And he's like, I need to like publish a paper or like scream this to the mountaintops. And I'm like, dude, there's like four people that are interested in this. But still, um, <laughs> it, it's, it's fascinating that he has totally, and I've seen it with my own eyes, he's cracked this code on these prehensile-tailed skinks that to me says they are so much smarter than we give them credit for because they yeah. do want something. They do want something in return for a behavioral, um, you know, for a display of behavior. It's just not food. They're not motivated by diet. They're, and, and as reptiles, by the way, that makes sense, right? Like, not all rep- reptiles don't need to eat a whole lot. A lot of them. Some of them do. But a lot of them don't need to eat a whole lot. So why be motivated by food if you're like, yeah, I can go three months without a meal. Like, you, you're offering me the same thing you offered me yesterday at noon for doing nothing. Um, <laughs> why would I go for this? And I don't know. I found it really, really interesting. So I want to hear your, your thoughts on that. You, I've never even owned one. I mean, I've held like three in my life. I don't know those animals well. What do you think about that? Well, I think it's amazing. I mean, I think I think he, please film that. 
because that would be Seriously. the most incredible thing I've ever seen. And I don't disagree. The one thing I always say is that with all reptiles, that they are way, way, way more intelligent than people give them credit. And we've proved that with our place, the training that we've done mm-hmm. with the animals. I mean, people come to our place, even reptile people come, and they're blown away at the things that we do. They're like, I've never cool. seen anything like that in my life. you know. And I'm like, that's because we approach them more like you would approach training a porpoise or something on that lines, um, as that's opposed cool. to like saying these are dumb and so on like that. So as far as our <laughs> monkey tail skinks, uh, they, they're a very interesting animal. They come from the Solomon Islands. There's, uh, they, they, they live in communal uh, groups. So they, right. they mate for life and they bond for life. And then what happens in this wow. communal group, you might have five or six pair of, of, of monkey tail skinks. And, um, and, and by the way, I, I heard the story about the guy that, that uh, uh, named them monkey tail skinks. It was, it was a wholesaler. Do you remember? I don't know if you remember L.A. Reptile way long time ago. It was a big reptile importer. Was it, back that, in the 70s did that have anything to do with Jay Brewer, or was that independent no, of Jay? No, that wasn't Jay. It was, uh, okay. it was uh, uh, um, uh, I can't remember. It, Chris was, I can't remember his last name. Chris was the, the owner. And gotcha. in the 70s, 80s, they were the, one of the biggest reptile wholesalers in the country. And okay. what was happening was they were bringing in Solomon Island skinks or prehensile tail skinks. And no one knew what prehensile tail meant or Solomon Island meant, so he termed them <laughs> monkey tail skinks. Yeah, so I've heard I've heard that name before, by the way. Yeah. I just, yeah, as so, a scientist, so refuse to say that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so prehensile tail skinks are what they are supposed to be called, but the, the hobby calls them monkey tail skinks, which is, is just right. the, the slang term that a guy in L.A. made up. But anyways, right. um, so what's interesting is that they, they made for life. They stay in this hierarchy group. They only have one baby every other year, on occasion twins. And, uh, and what's interesting is that when they have that baby, the baby stays with them for about a year, and the entire group protects the baby, even if it's not That's their amazing. offspring. And yeah, then at wow. about a year old, they kick them out of the group, and they have to go start their own group. So it's, 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 so my point is they have to be intelligent, you know, yeah. right? Yeah, now, that's it, super right complex behavior. Started. Yeah, right. but but it's so so they're they're in, I love 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 prehensile tail skinks um and, and they're in the ones we have are super super dope but uh, uh but yeah we haven't been able to target train them so that makes sense maybe I need to in the sun we might have a problem here in Michigan <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well that's the problem isn't it but yeah. uh, try it man I, I I don't know you know I don't know much about those animals I actually didn't know that that was how they raise their young I mean that is yeah. that is like a social structure. That's it sort is. of unheard of in, in reptiles. And isn't that amazing exactly. that they do something yeah. like that? I mean, I mean some crocodilians amazing. are probably the closest thing to that, you know. Right. I think With nest and, and, and mm-hmm. Exactly, you know, which is really interesting. But, uh, but yeah, I find that they're one of my more uh, I, I beloved reptiles for sure. Well, really, scientifically, the smartest uh, reptiles are the reptilians that come from the Centurion galaxy. Isn't that oh, accurate? Oh, boy, you are a dummy. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so, Brian. I, I'm, I'm a believer. <laughs> Me too. See? Right. That's right. But, but, pa- Peter and Patrick, I'm pretty sure. I can definitely speak for Peter. I don't know about Patrick. They're convinced, by the way, that a- that octopus are aliens. They came on a comet from out of space. See, I mean, see what I, I think did there's there? some science behind yeah. that. I think there's some there science is, behind that. There is. There is. There's yeah. substantial science behind it, and that's why these guys are completely convinced. What are your thoughts on that? <laughs> no, I, I, I don't, you know... I think that panspermia can certainly be something that mm-hmm. happens, you know, and, and, and I think that um, uh, the fact that there's no other animal that has DNA that's anything like octopus on the planet makes you wonder, did it literally evolve from a completely separate entity here right. on this planet or right. was it placed here uh, through panspermia or maybe alien? Like, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm a believer. I think it's definitely alien for sure. Yeah. I love so it. Cool. I love it. So cool. There's one of the videos one on your channel team. that I liked, uh, Brian, what made you decide that you were going to take an albino alligator to pet smart? <laughs> <laughs> these are the, you know, these are the big questions. Yeah, he. <laughs> and she wanted an outfit for Halloween. Was coming. She told me <laughs> Got it. She wanted an outfit, and I had no choice. I mean, where else? I, I was looking for the alligator costume aisle. And by the way, PetSmart doesn't have one. Uh, but uh, but no, PetSmart. What? It was what? <laughs> yeah. PetSmart. Get your shit together. I know what the heck. You know? No, it was one of those things that again, every now and then we do something that is, um, you know, uh, that shows people that these reptiles are more than just cold-blooded 
non-thinking animals. And and so if you're going to take your dog to PetSmart, why can't I take my alligator PetSmart? <laughs> right. And, 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 and we did, by the way, for the record, we did contact them before, asked them if their permission, uh, they, they, they accepted our, our, our We're like, our you have how many subs on YouTube? Three, 3.3 3 million. Yeah. Yeah. Come on by. Come for sure. <laughs> yeah. well, weirdly, enough, weirdly enough, the, the the hierarchy at PetSmart wasn't that happy about it. But uh, but the manager of the local pet shop, PetSmart, was fine. I could she see comes that. into the yeah. room. Uh, but but as a matter of fact, she she told me after I did that video that they didn't take grief. I wouldn't say, but they did say that we had to be more careful uh, with approving certain things. So I can't take an alligator back, but I did take my armadillo back there uh, nice. uh, uh, at there a go. later date. So, so they're there great at the, the local pet smart. And uh, I try to support, uh, you know, local pet shops and, and uh, even though pet smart is a, is a corporate thing, it's also locally run. And so, so, uh, but, but most of, most of the, 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 the things we buy, honestly, are from mom and pop shops in the area, to be honest with you, but they just don't have as many customers. So it's not as fun to take stuff to them. Right. <laughs> sure. All right. I want to play a game. Oh, you got no. you got some, Peter? Before we play, no, I, I had a game say, in mind. Like I feel like people who are working at pet shops, regardless of which one, they're passionate about animals because it's not yeah. like you know, it's 100%. not a job that you're. It's not like oh, I'm gonna work at McDonald's or the pet store, whichever one gives me a job first. So uh, I remember going into uh, Petco, which is the one that we have in Santa Barbara, and picking up live mice to feed my rosy boas because um, they've they've only ever taken lives. And uh, I grab them, I, they put them in the little box that they always put them in, and I put them in the, uh, like, grocery bag, right? Like, just, you know, the old plastic grocery bag that they used to hand out and still do in some places. And I, like, started walking out of there, kind of swinging it, you know, not twirling it, but just sort of loosely swinging it around like you do groceries, you know? <laughs> and the, the guy that sold me the mice that were going to be eaten by my snakes ran over, snatched the bag out of my hand, and is like, Sir! And I was like, yes. He's like, those are live animals. And I was like, I like froze and panicked because I'm like a wildlife guy. I love animals more than anything in the whole world. And this, right. this like Petco employee was screaming at my like animal welfare treatment. And, and all I could do was be like, you're right. I, I'm, I'm sorry. And I like took them very gently and took them out. And I was like, these are going to be dead in like seven minutes, but I will still be very nice to them until that time. Good. And um, it was just like, it was so shocking when that dreamer. happened. No, he was right. He was absolutely right. And and if that guy's oh, yeah. listening right now, I'm I'm sorry that I was twirling the mice around. But uh, it uh, he was he was like right. He was absolutely right. And not the mice twirling, but I like um, I like the outcome of that story. Well, the yeah, middle part. Or, the mice well, died. Yeah, the, yeah, um, not that, part not of the snakes eating them. Is that the no, no? The middle, yeah. I mean, the, the second middle. I don't know. I, one part of this. Story. Yeah. Okay, All right, I want to play it. a game. I got a game. Yeah. I got a game. You ready for this game? Okay. Yes. Ryan. Welcome to the team. You are the newest producer of Extinct or Alive. It's a fantastic show where we go around the world looking for extinct animals. But, sir, as a wildlife, as a reptile expert, we need you to come up with an episode where Forrest and team and yourself go and find an extinct reptile. Now, here's the kicker, Mr. Barczyk. If you don't find it, the show is canceled and your zoo gets shut down. What are you looking for? <laughs> Man, you know, there's only one animal that, that ha we have to look for, but I think the show is getting canceled, unfortunately. That's okay. Uh -huh. That's all right. Maybe we take that caveat out because that was a little much. Yeah, that's a bummer. Uh, well, the it's, zoo it's, closing it's, is, is okay, though. So. Yeah, yeah, the zoo, yeah, the zoo closing is good. But, uh, no, it's Titanobo. It's got to be. Wow. That is not where I thought you were going with that. That's cool. Yeah. Titanobo. Yeah, so, Brian, for those that don't know, Tell us about this gargantuan snake from South America. Yeah, I mean, it's literally like a cousin or an ancestor of the boa constrictor, but can get, you know, 80 to, to, to 100 feet long, can be up to 2,500 pounds. They found fossils of these, so we know they're real. We know that they existed on the earth at some time. And um, I'm obsessed with titanoboa. Uh, I have been my whole life, ever, well, not my whole life, ever since they, they came out with this thing. And you can see, I mean, they look very similar to a, to a boa constrictor, but just an absolute, yeah. I mean, you could see these pictures, the size of the people compared to the snake. I mean, I, I, what does that snake even eat? I mean, it's... Fuck I'm I am mean, glad I would, these do not exist. <laughs> oh my gosh! I would, I would, I would breed titanoboas if I, if they still existed. They, I'm obsessed with them. But that's that's 100. percent I would spend the next 30 years of my life in a South American jungle looking for titanoboas if there was any chance that there was one still alive. I love that, and I've heard stories in South America of people believing that they're still there. By the way, yeah, um, I know. 
Also, One, the network would love this. They would they would die. They would go for this easily because it's a big, scary creature. Oh, True. Yeah. Yes. Um, Let's so do it. Have you ever heard Brian the story? And I'm going to butcher all the details. But basically, during World War One, there was a Dutch pilot who was a who was a very well decorated war hero. He had multiple medals, so on and so forth. And he was in the Congo. Have you heard the story? Do you know what I'm talking about? I don't know. Yeah. No, okay. Don't know. And you should look this up. And I'm I'm sure I'm getting most of the details wrong, but I remember reading <laughs> it and I was absolutely enthralled by it. So you've got this war hero veteran, multi decorated war hero, right? He's the pilot. In that same plane with him while he's flying are three other soldiers, all like, you know, reputable soldiers. They have zero reason to lie or make any of this up. And as they're flying around over the Congo, they spot something down below. And it's a big coiled something or other. And the, the pilot, the decorated hero, just says, let's go in and take a closer look. This looks very foreign in this weird Congolese jungle. And they fly down and they report not just the decorated war hero, but all three other soldiers that were on the plane report a 50 foot long snake that, that when they took low passes over this clearing in the jungle, struck at the plane. And they <laughs> all say, swear to God, that they saw the snake. They all have independent reports of it. They all say it was 50 to 70 feet long, you know, based on their best assessment. They didn't see it and leave. They took like seven or eight passes over this snake to, to, to see it because they couldn't believe their eyes and they knew no such thing existed before they left, and they left it sitting there still coiled and striking in defensive mode. And on the first pass, every single one of them reports that this thing actually struck at the plane. And uh, oh, crazy. it's like very well documented. It's like it's like uh, there were military documents that show these people reporting this. This colonel's outright. He's like, I have no reason to lie. You know, I'm a war hero, blah, 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 blah. All three of the soldiers on the plane reported it all independently. And they all said there is a 50 foot snake right here in this jungle. We all saw it. Why is nobody believing us or listening to us? Wow. That's a true crazy. story. And listen, Isn't that amazing? You know, You've been to a lot of exotic places. I certainly have been to. You know, um, it, 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 there's they're out there, man. They're out there. You there's, think so? There's, huh? there's, you know, you know, you guys have found stuff that was extinct. You know, I mean, come on. Right. You know, I mean, <laughs> you're just one team. You know, I mean, with the amount of rainforest, even though depleting uh, here in in the Congo, obviously amazing. Even the Pacific Northwest of the United States. Uh, the things that are probably never, you know, I mean, just dense, dense in the forests or jungles, there's got to be. And, I mean, remember Lulong, the, 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 uh, yeah. the, the yeah. water crop Lulong. canal? Yep. Yeah, I mean, that, you know, that was a tragic story, by the way. That thing lived probably 150 years in the wild and then died a month for, in captivity, um, sure. which was a yeah. shame. But, I mean, that was a, a, a gargantuan crocodile that was found in the wild that, that the, the, the natives have been reporting for like 100 years that it was there, but no one could ever catch it. Right. So right, I think right, right. Um, I, I do believe that in the deep in the forest, there is a, a 50 foot. Well, OK, so first off, you probably know about the Teddy Roosevelt, you know, reward for a 50 foot snake. Uh -huh. Have you ever heard of this? Yep. $50,000. So yeah, $50,000 turned out later after Teddy Roosevelt died. The, 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 the reward went to $100,000 in his trust. And I think in the 70s or 80s, they discontinued it. But so for almost 100 years, you know, several decades at least, there was a reward for anyone live or dead that could come up with a 50 foot snake. And mm -hmm. still to this day, no one has claimed that prize. That being right. said, you can't tell me that it isn't out there somewhere. You know, it's out I there somewhere. That. It's just, it's just you know, a matter of, of being the right person to find at the right time, you know? I just and, put and a, the, a picture in the chat, Peter. So they actually took a picture. They were in a, they were in a helicopter for us. That was one of the details. Uh, gotcha. The right. Dutch pilots. It was in 1959. They did take a picture, but they're so, it's like there's nothing for scale, right? Exactly, um, yeah. Yep, so yep. it's but so there is a picture of the snake and obviously their first hand accounts are the only thing that says it was 50 feet and it struck at the helicopter. Yep. I, I believe him. Why would they make this up? You think four pilots and a helicopter flying over the Congo are like, you want to do a hoax today? Totally. That's yeah. what I'm saying. And, and this guy, <laughs> <Right>. this Colonel <laughs> Remy Van Leerd, I'm, I'm just pulled up your link as well. W why? Why risk your credibility as a decorated war hero to say nonsense? Right. right. Like right. as someone who's like. Yeah, I mean, why, why be like, nope, I'm just going to make this up. It's funny. 
Like, it's just, it's ridiculous. Like, they definitely saw something. Yeah, well, you see it right there. It's cool. That, yeah, the interesting thing is in the Congo, I wouldn't think there would even be a large constrictor. I mean, African rock pythons are in, in but I don't even think African rock pythons are in the Congo, if I'm not mistaken. I They're could not. be completely They're not. wrong about no, it. No, you're, so, you're right. So, They're not. So what snake would that be? You know, that's that's the thing. I mean, if, it was, if, if, if it was in West Africa, let's say it was in Ghana or Benin or Togo, you would say, yeah, maybe that's a 25-foot rock python that just, you know, they thought was 50 foot. But, but in the Congo, I don't even know what that would be. But, Brian, and here's the game, right? Think about where all of our large semi-aquatic snakes or, or just large boa constrictors and pythons come from. It's in deep tropical jungles, right? In South yes. America, we have the anacondas. In, in Indonesia, we have reticulated pythons. Even in the yeah. forests of Australia is where we have giant scrub pythons and things like that. Yeah. So yeah. the natural place for a snake to convergently evolve in that huge way in Africa is not in the savanna lands. It's not in the sub-Sahara. It's not in West yeah. Africa or North Africa. It's in that green belt of the Congo yeah. that is, comp yeah. no, I won't say completely, but is very biologically unexplored and to this day remains basically too dangerous for people to go in there and do all of the science that needs to be done. And I'll tell you, I was in Mozambique uh, earlier last year and I was talking to guys that are, they work in the field of wildlife science. They're like animal translocation experts and things like that. And they were showing me pictures from Mozambique, which is not nearly as dangerous or difficult of a country. And they're like, oh, look at this thing. And it's like this fluffy little reptile looking thing. And I'm like, what is that? And they're like, oh, we don't know. Some villager took a picture of it. He was the only guy who had a flip phone. Nobody knows what it is. We went back to try find it. We gave it a couple days. Nobody found it. It's like, yeah. of course, that's how you find these things, by the way. That's how we've been right. successful on Extinct or Alive. It's, it's not the Western scientists that know that these things exist or know where they are. It's the people that live and breathe in these environments. It's the same story about the, the, the thylacine and possibly being in, in PNG or West Papua. It's not us. It's not the white guys sitting here on Zoom that can say yes or no, it's still there. It's the people that are out in the forest, in the jungle, in the woods, hunting every single day that know whether or not these things are real. It's just disseminating the fact that sometimes in those cultures, lore is very real to them. And so it's, it's like separating lore and, and fact from fiction. And that's more challenging than actually saying, is this animal here or not? Because if people tell you when they're there, it's just, is it there physically or is it there spiritually? And that's the thing that you have to try and figure out that's such a challenge. Oh, I can for imagine sure. it would be, that's for sure. But I agree with you. And, and, and again, I, there was a, a, a herpetological uh, a team that went into North Mozambique about a dozen years ago. And, and they, it was the first kind of research team that went into North Mozambique in like 50 years. And they discovered hmm. like 15 new species of reptiles. Not and, surprised, and, and, and not the at all. expedition was only like a two-week expedition. So wow. And by the way, Mozambique... Topic. There are resorts all over Mozambique. Like, they're not resorts like we think of, like, go to Cabo San Lucas. But there are, like, very cute little dive lodges up and down the entire coast of Mozambique that services tourists from South Africa and Europe. And, like, I, I'm guessing they weren't on this, like, you're thinking expedition. You're thinking this hardcore nar. They're probably staying in, like, a little dive bungalow drink, drinking Mai Tais. And they're herpetologists, so you know they weren't up at the crack of dawn. They were up around 10 a.m. They're like, yeah, sun's coming up. Let's head out. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. and they found 15 new species. Imagine if you're going into the middle of nowhere Congo, like, where you're really on an expedition. And, you know, people do this. I'm not saying nobody does it, but, like, especially in Africa, more so than South America, more so than Asia. By the way, 200 new species just discovered in the Mekong region. Don't know if you guys saw that. Huge news, wow. including wow. a bunch of reptiles. Like, that's where, in my opinion, Papua New Guinea and, and Central Africa, that's where the biggest yeah. biological discoveries are to come out of. And they are, are, there is, in my opinion, megafauna, not just microfauna, to be discovered still. Well, yeah, I mean, what was it like? I mean, it was what in the... It was in the 90s or whenever it was. You probably know that the, the there was a great ape that was found in Vietnam. Uh, like yeah. the, in, hmm. I know about the Saula in the 90s, which is a big uh, bovid that was found. in I think 95 was when it was officially 
uh, okay, declared. Okay, so maybe that's what I'm talking about. But that's, yeah, the, the, the local people for hundreds of years were saying there was this creature and, and then all of a sudden we found them, and now they've been, you know, first they were recorded on video, and then now they've been, you know, they know all about them. But but that's right. a, it was like a 200-pound animal or something like that that was just yeah. a, a, a mystery yeah. for 200 years, and it's actual right. reality. So, I no, I'm a huge believer. That's why I liked your guys' show, too, is because it, it, uh, it, it was, it's what guys like me dream of. Right. You know what I mean? It's totally. like I dream to do, you know, I, you know, I, I would love nothing else to spend my life looking around. And I know you're a thylacine maniac, you know. And, <laughs> and I know one day you'll find that damn thing. I guarantee you will. I'm going to keep trying, gonna, that's for sure. <laughs> oh, I hey. think you will. You know, I, I think it'll be it. I love that you feel that way. So can I can I announce something to our brosners? Something that all four of us know that nobody else knows? No one else knows, so let's do it. Ladies and gentlemen, brosners of all shapes, sizes, and colors... Brian is putting together another harebrained incredible wildlife thing, and this is a big announcement. It is an animal con. It's going to be like the biggest convention for animal nerds from around the world. And guess what, ladies and gentlemen? The Wild Times podcast crew, Peter, Patrick, and myself, are going to be going to WildCon. Yes, and we encourage, the Brosners have been asking, they've been saying, where can we meet you guys? Where can we learn about animals with you guys from the podcast? Where can we come and see you? And we are going to be at Brian's Animal Con. Brian, tell us about it. Yeah, so yeah, so we're doing it the 26th, 27th, 28th of uh, August in Orlando. Uh, there's going to be... Um, uh, all the, you know, basically any animal personality you can think of from, you know, from TV, uh, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok. Uh, we, we, we've just, this has been a brainchild of mine, much like the, the drinking game. Um, <laughs> bad, bad timing, uh, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, I was thinking about this and it's the worst time to put on a, a, a convention. So it's been shelf. But now that we feel like we're getting into a good spot in life, we think we're going to be behind us this summer. We decide to move forward with it. And uh, so it is, uh, think about the Comic-Con type of thing, but for animal people. And uh, so, so, cool. so it's cool. going to have... Yeah, just tons of really great. So there'll be, like you said, there'll be panels with you guys on it, talking about your adventures around the world. There'll be Q and A's. There'll be fan meetups. There'll be uh, all kinds of events that can happen that are just like you said for, pe like people like me when I was seventeen or eighteen would have loved to go see, uh, you know, all those animal people on TV at the time. You know, what I mean, whether right. it was Attenborough or or Steve Irwin or, or whoever the case was at the time. You know, totally. if, if I could have went to a place and, and met them, and now there are hundreds of those people. There's not just a dozen of them. There's hundreds right. of these people. You know, right. from from reptiles to fish to 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 bugs to to you name it. You know, what I mean, yep. any animal personality, and and we're, we. You know, we're so, so pleased and, and blessed that you guys are going to come out there. And, and it's in a beautiful resort uh, in Orlando. It's called the Caribe Royale. We'll be launching the site. It'll be called AnimalConUSA.com. Launching in about two to three weeks. Uh, so Perfect. we're putting that together. Um, you know, just keep an eye on any social. I'm sure you'll announce it when we do it as well. Absolutely. And, um, and, and, and then, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's gonna, it's, it's been a dream of mine. And, and my, my outcome of this, everything I do in life, whether it's my Reptarium, whether it's this project, whether it's YouTube, whether it's Instagram, whatever, is about reaching people with the love of animals. Period. That's all that I care about, right? And this is a love way that. that we can gr get. 10,000 people together that are passionate and can share and collaborate and start meeting people. And, and who knows what relationships are going to be built, who, built? And who knows what 10-year-old is going to walk through that door and meet you guys and be the next extinct or alive 20 years from now? You know, And, that's, and, and that's, that's why I'm doing it. And that's why I'm excited. And, uh, and so far, uh, we're super, super uh, pumped on, on on the commitments that we've had. Uh, we've already got uh, with the group, and, and I've just really started. I mean, you guys were were one of the first people, first handful of people I asked. So, so I've Thank just you. gotten started, but we already have over seventy commitments from from influencers and creators uh, from across uh, the animal world uh, to the tune of about one hundred and fifty million combined outreach. 
Wow. Uh, so, and, and we've just gotten started. We've just gotten started. Right. And, uh, and we have some some pretty major sponsors we'll be announcing over the next couple weeks as well on the on the thing. So the event should be a pretty big hit. And, um, and hopefully we can just continue to inspire that, you know, this generation and the next generation, that if we aren't fighting for wildlife, uh, we're screwed, you know. So that's what this is about. Bob, that's that. awesome, that. man. That's going to be fun. So we will, and for anybody listening... If you guys don't know this, depending on where you're listening, we have a Patreon, we have a YouTube, we have all the social media channels. We're going to do everything we can to, to push this for you, Brian. We're going to make sure that our brosners, our listeners, can come there and meet us in person and come yeah. and to the Animal Con and not just meet us, but meet everybody. All these people that we're discussing that can come and share their love of knowledge. So, brosners, you've been asking about uh, where to meet us, where to hang out. This is it. Animal Con USA, baby, Orlando, Florida. Yes. Let's go. <laughs> so nice. thank you guys, man. It means the world to me. You guys are going to be amazing, and we're going to treat you like uh, royalty. I can guarantee you that. <laughs> Ooh, beautiful. I like the sound Dude, of that. Thank you so much, Brian, for inviting us, Pierre, you know, first of all. And also, uh, thanks for coming on the show, man. I think the, the yeah, Brosners are going to love this. Where can, uh, in case they don't know where to find you, where do they find you? I mean, literally, if you just type Brian Snake Guy, Brian Animal Guy, Brian Bar Check, Brian, you'll find me. You know, I'm, uh, you know it's, it's 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 pretty uh, pretty pretty easy to find. And he's the and, guy. Uh, yeah, it's just you know, it's it's. I appreciate anyone following me on any level. I mean, I can't do the things that I do now without the people that follow me. And I'm so uh, so absolutely blessed to have friends like you guys now. And and. Uh, and, and, and to be in this community. So, uh, so yeah, so, it, you know, welcome along on the journey. It's a wild one. <laughs> wild time. Wild time. Yeah, that's Brian, man. thanks yeah. for coming on the show. Really appreciate it. Well, guys, it's been a good one. That I learned a shitload. Uh, yeah, it was awesome. It has, Forrest, I've never, I haven't seen you that excited in, in many moons, my friend. About I love what? your energy. Oh, Pat. I just like Brian. He's a cool guy. <laughs> he is. He's a great guy. Love you, Pat. Uh, Thanks, man. You guys, yeah. You guys uh, head over to the wildtimes.com forward slash info for all the links Wild Time, at Wild Times Pod on all the socials to follow us. And, of course, I, I hung up some merch. There's my uh, spirit animal shirt over there now in the background. Yeah. That's still available. We never talk about it. It's there. It's always <laughs> true. There. We never talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and of course, the Patreon at Wild Times Pod. Patreon.com forward slash Wild Times Pod. Jesus. Uh, what are you I, I drunk, know, mate? It's, 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 uh, <laughs> he I, is. Yeah. He's a mess. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah. Love you guys. Yeah. <laughs> Animal Con, Animal Con, we're going to a convention, I, yeah. I just looked at the resort, it looks nice, there's a fun pool. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, lots of cocktails. We'll be drinking.